launching the National Museum of Railway Derby. Please, Ella. <laughs> Um, I can actually speak through this mask on. It's a new one since last time, but I think I am going to take it out. And then you'll be able to hear me slightly better. Um, so for those of you who don't know what on earth I'm wearing, hopefully it's going to become clear very, very soon. Because tonight, I'm very excited. This is a momentous day, and I'm very glad that you're all here to join me. Because we are here in Glasgow Women's Library to launch the National Museum of Roller Derby. This will be the UK's first official archive of ephemera and memorabilia relating to this new and exciting all-female, full-contact sport of roller derby. And I'm very excited, as Adele mentioned, that we've got lots of special guests here in the audience today, people who I'm assuming have never been to the library before, so thank you so much for coming along. We've got some of Glasgow's finest roller derby players here tonight. We have the founder of the Roller Derby League, who I'm going to introduce you to later. We have Moxie Blitz here, who's the chair director of Glasgow um, Roller Derby. We have Cara Viola, who's in the A team, and at the back there, we have Fighting Talk. And May, is it Meg for Mercy and Rogue Runner, who are all also in Glasgow's 18, the Iron Bruisers? Okay, so hopefully you'll have more chance to talk to them later, provided that I don't go on too long. And because we're running ahead of schedule, I think I might just go on for a really long time. <laughs> Sorry. Because um, I want to tell you a little bit, um, a little more about where the ideas for the museum came from, and to tell you a bit about the ethos. For the museum's collection. So it was back at the end of 2011 when I was first invited to work on the anniversary project with the Women's Library and I always knew that I was going to take a slightly different approach to the brief. It was quite a loose brief but I knew that I was going to take quite a different approach because I'm not the sort of artist that generally makes prints or really makes anything that is vaguely commodifiable or hangable on a wall. But I do have some useful skills, as I was telling you about at the last event, and those are mainly skills in um, project organisation, PR, um, and admin. So I wanted to do something where I could use these skills that I do have, that would have a lasting, to create something that would have a lasting impact on the library, and hopefully would create this new legacy for the library, which would enable it to live on long into the future. So set my sights quite high, um, but the first step was to start in February coming in and working in the library one day a week. And it was really, without sounding too cheesy, inspirational experience, just meeting the people who set up the library and who work here on a daily basis and the women who come in and use the library um, regularly. And there's all sorts of stuff that happens here, like English as a foreign language courses, and lifelong learning and literacy and numeracy stuff. Just amazing amount of resources for women that happen in this library that I had no idea about. But while I was in here, I also began browsing through the collections and learning more about women's history. And the thing that specifically inspired me was learning about the women's liberation movement of the 1970s. So this was the entire decade before I was born in 1979. And shamefully, I knew literally nothing about this until I discovered this one book, which is that actually a picture of me holding this book. I was like, oh, there it is. That's my book. Read that book. It's good. <laughs> uh, that's basically everything you need to know about women's liberation in one book. Um, but what was fascinating about this is the way that it was organised and the way that it spread around the country so quickly. So the first conference was in 1970, and then small groups popped up all around the country um, over the course of the decade. So it was collectively organised, but it was also interesting learning about what its demands were. And these demands, most significantly, things like equal pay for equal work, equal education and equal opportunities, and free access to contraception and abortion. So these are things that we totally take for granted now, 
but things that we might still not have had it not been for the thousands of women who fought tirelessly um, to, for these necessary changes to be made in legislation. So this is kind of the bread and butter of our shared history. This is the stuff that we should all know about and the stuff that we should remember. And it's the real history that organisations like the Women's Library were set up to try to preserve. So the sad fact is, and I'm happy to, well, I'm not happy to admit to this, but I will admit to this, is the fact that if I hadn't have been invited to do the project with the Women's Library, I probably would still not yet have set foot inside the library. And since I've been working here, once, one day a week since February, everybody who all have uh, been shocked at the number of people who I've mentioned the library to, my peers, people my age, people younger, who've also not set foot inside the library and not had the opportunity to access this amazing resource that's all around us. So I started to wonder what I could possibly do to try to rectify this. What could I try to do to reach a whole new audience? To help update the collection that's in here and to make it relevant to a younger <coughs> group of women and also to make it super fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> if it isn't super fucking cool already. <laughs> um, so all these thoughts were racing round and round and round in my head while I was skating round and round and round on the track, learning to play roller derby myself. So it was towards, also towards the end of 2011 when I first began to hear the buzz around this new sport called roller derby. Bit of a slow, a bit <laughs> slow on the uptake, sorry girls. Um, but it all happened actually when I was working down in Newcastle on this project for a festival called Wonderbar Festival called the Desk Chair Disco. So another story for another time. But we got the Newcastle Roller Girls to come down and to do a demonstration which involved desk chairs and roller skates. It was all quite exciting. Um, but what was most exciting was talking to the women who were doing playing this roller derby and hearing their stories. Because they were all women who had normal jobs quite high-powered jobs, a lot of them, in the daytime, working in hospitals, libraries, teachers, researchers, chemists, quite a lot of them I've discovered are actually trained activists, uh, artivi archivists <laughs> and librarians, which is very, very useful. Um, but by night, they all took on these alter egos and relentlessly trained together on the track. So these Newcastle Roller Girls, they egged me on when I got back to Glasgow to sign up with Glasgow Roller Derby. They did warn me that Glasgow Roller Derby, Glasgow Roller Girls were very hard <laughs> and that I should watch out. <laughs> so I was terrified and over Christmas, this was the end of 2011, my mum bought me a pair of skates <laughs> on eBay. They are actually a bit crap, I need to get new ones. Um, and then on the 10th of January, 2012, I turned up for the first day of training with over 60 other newbie skaters. An amazing turnout of young women who'd come to learn. So this was the beginning of my indoctrination. <laughs> like the library itself, Roller Derby, as I've discovered, is a whole new world. It is an inspirational community which is completely run on a grassroots ethos in which everybody does their own little bit. These amazing women who are scattered amongst the audience this evening invest their time, they give their time and a hell of a lot of their time to organise everything that happens in the league, all of the activities including running the training sessions so that new women like me, and there's a new training session just started, I think there's two or three a year intakes, so that new women can continually come and learn so that the sport can expand. And it is a very intensive training programme, it's a full on three hour uh, session every Tuesday evening. So. Uh, Tuesday was my women's day because I was coming and working in here and then going to do the roller derby. Um, but it took 17 weeks and then on the 1st of May I was very pleased to finally pass my, my minimum requirements and then to graduate as a rookie into league training and we've got our next test next week. Um, 
but it's thanks to this grassroots ethos and the dedication and the passion of women like these amazing women who are here tonight it's because of this that roller derby has spread like wildfire all over the globe in less than one decade um, the officiating body of Women's Flat Track Roller Derby, the Women's Flat Track Roller Derby Association, was founded in America in 2004. Um, Woofter, it's as it's affectionately <laughs> known. Um, and it was set up with a governing ph philosophy of by the skaters, for the skaters. And the slogan on the back of the official rule book here, which really inspired me, is real strong athletic revolutionary. So it was two years after WIFTA was set up that the first roller derby league was founded in the UK. It was Gar uh, London Roller Girls in 2006. And this was quickly followed by Birmingham Blitz Danes, London Rock and Rollers, and then our very own Glasgow Roller Girls, which was set up in 2007. In just five years, since 2007, the sport has completely exploded all around the country, and there are now more than 90 of these um, grassroots, women-run leagues all over the country, in England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. History is being made, but history is being made so quickly that there's barely been any time to properly document it. Merchandise and memorabilia, such as these belt programmes, which are published for each of the, the um, matches that are organised, feature, I'll pass these around actually, um, feature all of these images of these outrageously um, scary looking <laughs> women. <laughs> Can I have a look at those? Um, so these things are being published left, right and centre. And there's no official infrastructure for archiving them. So then suddenly, it all started to make sense. I felt as though I'd stumbled upon a project which could attempt to bring together these two distinct yet equally inspirational communities of women that would become a sort of intergenerational exchange, which I hoped would be a really positive thing, which would have mutual benefits for everybody involved. And so, the National Museum of Roller Derby was born. And from this day forth, its collection will be safely housed and maintained within Glasgow Women's Library. This library, which is also an accredited museum, will provide a permanent place where these materials, and this is the beginning of the museum, right down here on the floor. <laughs> this is the first donation that has been made this evening by Cara Viola. This was a box which may, well, there's actually a newspaper in here which was sat in Mistress Malicious's sock drawer. <laughs> it is now in the museum. <laughs> this is why we need the museum. Um, <laughs> so, these ma materials can finally be preserved and also made publicly accessible. Not that your sock drawer isn't publicly accessible, it might well be. But here, here they will be more publicly accessible. The National Museum of Roller Derby's collection will be built on the same ethos of Glasgow Women's Library, that of collective ownership. Everything in this library has been donated at some point by women all around the country. So the National Museum of Royal Adobe will be a shared collection, it will be our collection, and it will help to create, I hope, stature for this much-loved sport, which apparently is um, aiming to get included in the Olympics in 2020. This is what I said on Wikipedia. <laughs> and maybe the museum will assist in this. Who knows? And it will also help, I hope, to cement Glasgow as one of the key centres for this sport in the UK and also across Europe. Um, and as the sport begins to open up to its first male participants, 
It feels vital that we ensure that its impassioned development over the course of the first decade remains retains its importance within the trajectory of women's history. We must take steps now to preserve the real history of how it all came to be. And as it grows and grows and grows over the course of the next year, I hope that the National Museum of Roller Derby collection will also become a valuable asset for the library. And I hope that it will give it this new lease of life in its 20th anniversary year and when it goes into its new um, bigger, better, permanent home later in the year. So, again, I have a dream. <laughs> I have a dream that Roller Derby fans, young girls and young boys and old girls and old boys alike from all across the country will come here to the Glasgow Women's Library to view the archive. And once inside, they will get an opportunity to browse and discover other things, just as I did, about the lives and achievements of our ancestors throughout history. Because it is now more than ever vital that we remind ourselves of the gains that were made by women in the past and the fight and the struggles that they endured to win us the vote or to get us equal pay. Otherwise, if we don't remain vigilant to these things, these gains could just as equally be taken away. And it's very um, distressing to read these numerous reports that have been published recently about the disproportionate impact that austerity measures are having on women's lives. Mm -hmm. um, there's an article from earlier in the year, just before the budget came out in The Guardian, but also the Fawcett Society have published reports that are showing that unfortunately, um, rather than continuing on this trajectory towards equality that was started almost a century ago by the suffragettes, or more than a century ago rather, we're now actually entering a phase where this is starting to go in reverse. It's terrifying. So, I am over the moon that we're all here together tonight, that so many people have come along and that there's so many faces here. Um, I'm hoping that this is going to be massive. And since the Facebook page went live today, the in my inbox <laughs> has just gone bam. And I'm quite scared at like, what I've taken on with this. So <laughs> there is a lot of response already, which is really positive. So here at Glasgow Women's Library, we're going to properly document the first frantic years of this amazing and empowering sport to show that it was women that made it happen. They made it happen by truly believing in something and by working together. Thank you. So, this is the fun bit, because I'm going to introduce you to a very, very special guest who I mentioned earlier. This is one of the women who, without whom, we would not have Glasgow Roller Girls, which you may, I'm, I'm wearing this because this is a historical t-shirt, by the way. This is the original logo from 2007, which has now morphed into the newer Glasgow Roller Derby logo, which they've all got in front. Anyway, I digress. Mistress Malicious, Scar other, Scar otherwise known as Scarlett Younger, the co-founder of Glasgow Roller Girls is here tonight. I'd love to invite her up here to show us one of the items which is going into the collection, which is very, very, very exciting. It's a photograph from 2007 of the first girls who, who, who were in the team. And then to cut the symbolic red ribbon, <laughs> at which point the donations will start flooding in <laughs> from all around the country. So please welcome Mistress Malicious. <laughs> Where's the photo? The photo's oh, in the, in the archive. Oh, it's in the museum already. <laughs> oh, it's very exciting. This was in. Um, in my sock drawer too. It was in the sock drawer, you see. This is why we need a museum. Um, this is the, the co-founder, Terry, Terry, Toxic. Terry Toxic, and myself with red hair. 
Um, and Venus Velocity, who still teaches our new skaters. And it's this hat that Venus has got on here, I just discovered, see, it's actually the same hat that I got on <laughs> right now, because I swapped it with her, because I, anyway, I don't guess. <laughs> but one day this will go in the, in the, in the museum as well. Yeah. But yes. In George Square, for the daily record, I think. Amazing. <laughs> Fantastic. So, who has... Who hasn't got a party popper? Has it? Oh, shh, shh, shh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, this is all quite exciting. <laughs> um, okay, when you're ready, <laughs> I'm very pleased to declare the National Museum of Roller Derby officially open! <laughs>